Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks very much, Duke, for inviting me here. Uh, I'm sure it was probably four and a half years ago for so me back. And I'm especially pleased to have been introduced by Amy. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had her as a professor at Canada. Can I do something wrong? As I was saying, uh, if you haven't had Amy as a professor, next uh, semester she's teaching three classes, so you should all take advantage of this opportunity. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about you know how we got where we are, and uh, I want to talk about some solutions, and some of them will pick up on, on uh, what Michael and Dick have already said. Okay, the number one first question. Okay, how did we get to this, which is uh, I think it, we all know now is the most severe financial crisis since the 1930s depression. There's no real debate about that fact. Uh, well, my first answer is very straightforward. Um, this is no uh, aberration. Okay? Uh, unregulated financial markets, unregulated uh, capitalism always leads to financial crises. And I'm not, I'm not being uh, uh, over dramatic here, and at the same time I want you to note the lack of nuance. Always, always in history, unregulated financial markets have always led to financial crises. There is no exception in any historical period in any region of the world. Always. Okay, now uh, let's just think about what's happened in the United States. I'll come back a little further back in history. In a let's think about what's happened just in the last 20 years. Okay, in 1987, we had a stock market crash, a massive stock market crash where we lost about 25, stock market lost about 25% of its value in a matter of days. At that point, uh, we had what we're having now, uh, bailout, a, a Federal Reserve, U.S. Treasury, bailout of the financial system to prevent which would have been, at that point, a massive, uh, unprecedented, or at least since the 1930s, financial crisis. So it was only the fact that we had this bailout in 1987 that we avoided uh, experiencing something akin to what we're experiencing today. Uh, Michael mentioned the savings and loan crisis. That was only two years later. Okay, that was 1989-1990. Uh, the old savings and loans. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie that plays uh, on Christmas Eve every year. It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. How many of you have seen that? Okay. Well, okay. After you sign up for Amy's class, make sure you go see it. It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, it's, it, it, the reason it plays, actually, is because there's no copyright on this movie, so that all, any station can pick it up and play it. Okay, Jimmy Stewart is the head of a savings and loan. The conception of what a savings and loan was then is very different than what it was now. The conception that comes out of that movie was that he was integral to his community, that he knew people in the community, he knew who, who he was dealing with, as opposed to the model we have now, which we just heard about, where we're talking about a globalized, uh, financial market that, uh, that stretches all the way down into the community, such as in It's a Wonderful Life, and then all the way out uh, into the global market. Okay, so the, the crisis of 89-90 was kind of the first uh, indicator of the breakdown of the old uh, savings and loan housing finance institutions and its integration into, as Michael was talking about, the world of uh, global speculative finance. And then again, we had a massive crash of the savings and loan system then, which was also bailed out. Hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money to, it was almost identical to what we are experiencing now, or we are in the process of experiencing, uh, the government buying the bad assets of these institutions. Now, savings and loan, don't really exist in the form that they existed before, as Michael was just talking about, where a savings and loan was a stable source 
of individual family uh, finance. Okay, 1997-98, we had the crisis of the global emerging market. So that at that time, the conception in the financial markets was, okay, we have these new emerging economies, East Asian economies, Latin American economies, the former Soviet Union, which are surefire winners. So let's put money into their financial markets and we get high returns. Well, that lasted for a few years and then it crashed. Okay, and it crashed. Now what went down with it? Uh, a lot of the major financial institutions were also at that time teetering on the brink of, of complete collapse. Um, uh, one I will cite because it's a, a particularly interesting case. It's called long-term capital management. Long-term capital management was a super hedge fund. It was, a, it was supposed to be the sharpest hedge fund that knew the best places to invest in the global economy. Why was it so much better than all the others? Well, because they had two winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics who had won for their work, research, on financial markets. So if anybody should know how financial markets work, of course, these two brilliant experts, winners of the Nobel Prize, who decided, well, after we got the Nobel Prize, maybe we can make a little more money. So they started this hedge fund, and so they were leading the speculative charge into emerging markets, into Russia, and guess what? They didn't understand the nature of risk in the markets, and when long-term capital management failed, Guess what happened then? They had to be bailed out. The Federal Reserve came in, the Treasury came in. We had another bailout to prevent an all-out collapse of the financial markets. Most recently, up until now, uh, many of you remember the crash of the stock market in 2001. Some people attribute that to 9-11, uh, uh, the terrorist attacks in New York, except the problem is the stock market crashed before 9-11. Stock market crashed uh, really uh, almost the day after Clinton left office in uh, 2000. He was very lucky to get out just in time. So this notion that Clinton was somehow managing the economy so much better uh, is really a matter of luck. If he had stayed in another six months, he would have left with a mess on his hands that, uh, that Bush then had. Uh, so what happened in 2001 with the stock market crash? Once again, we had to have a massive bailout uh, on Wall Street, uh, engineered by uh, Alan Greenspan, former head of the Federal Reserve, uh, Robert Rubin, who was the leading advisor to Barack Obama, and Lawrence Summers, who was the leading candidate to be Treasury Secretary in the new government. Okay, so the point is this. Uh, financial crises are capitalism as usual. There's nothing unique, there's nothing particularly uh, different. I mean, the particulars are different, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But the general pattern that uh, unregulated financial markets always lead to crises, always require bailouts, is confirmed over and over again in history, uh, most recently in these cases that I just mentioned over the last 20 years. Okay, what about this crisis? Well, we've already heard some uh, very good comments by Dick and Michael. I'll just add a couple more. Uh, as, as Michael said, uh, the, the problem really starts with this, the, the unique feature of this crisis was the idea of uh, thinking of mortgages, these, these simple, basic instruments like we get uh, when you watch the Jimmy Stewart movie, Savings and Loan, Lending to Your Neighbor, enabling them to own a house. Uh, of, of, of the geniuses on Wall Street recognizing that these could be treated as securities. So that they could be securitized just like stocks, bonds, and uh, derivatives. And in, in that situation, uh, the savings and loan, or the bank, they aren't really actually banks. The real thing, that they, they, the more accurate term is the term that's used on the inside, is they are originators. 